Let's try a bit of an experiment. Have a listen to the following scene without any footage and tell me if you recognize which game it's from. The Lord's son, Florian, and I, we loved each other. Dieter walked in on us in the stables. They drove me away. Florian hanged himself. Lord started drinking and the estate fell into ruin. That's the long and short of it. Okay, now have a listen to this one. I'm cold. We'll fetch you warm milk and honey. You'd like that. Very much. Thank you, Caroline. What are those dogs doing? Dogs? Did one, uh, did one sound better than the other? As many of you probably guessed, the first clip you listened to was a scene from The Witcher 3. And the second clip was, of course, taken directly from Animal Crossing New Horizons. No, no, kidding. It's some shitty voice work from the original Witcher game. Unsurprisingly, there is a massive difference in quality here. And of course, there's years of industry experience and millions of dollars in budget that help to account for that difference. But we're not here to talk about those reasons. We're here to figure out why I actually care about this character and what's going to happen to him. While if this character met the most tragic end imaginable, I would never think about him again. There could be many reasons for that, but one of the main ones, without a doubt, is the quality of the voice acting. One being very good, and the other being... Stop. Don't go out there alone. You know what, let's, let's just move on. We've only just begun. Voice acting is a fascinating yet fickle tool. When used effectively, it can help bring characters to life, add to the immersion of an experience, and enhance the depth of relationships and storytelling. Everything all right? Yeah, I'm fine. But when it's used poorly, it's not just forgotten. It actively detracts from all of those things I just mentioned. Before we move on, I want to make it clear that when I'm referring to voice acting for the purposes of this video, I'm referring to the comprehensive finished product of voice audio that is delivered to the player. In other words, that includes not just the delivery of the dialogue by the actor, but the writing, directing, and way in which the voice is presented, not to mention the mixing, processing, and quality of the voice file. It is everything that went into what you hear in-game. You people are monsters! Voice acting in games is used in many different ways and can fit into a multitude of categories. There's obvious things like cutscenes and story pieces, there's in-game dialogue, conversations, narration, there's environmental voice, reactive voice, voiced sound effects. And these categories aren't completely clean cut. Sometimes one type of voice can bleed into, or in some cases, even fully transform into another type. We will stop enhancing the truth in three, two, one. In fact, it's oftentimes during these hybrid moments that games are able to stand out as a truly unique medium for delivering voice. For example, are the audio logs in Bioshock considered narration, story pieces, in-game dialogue? It doesn't really matter how you categorize it. The important thing to know is that the way voice acting is delivered in a game is going to determine its purpose, its role, and many times its impact on the player. And one of the cool things about games specifically is how the interactive component inherent in playing them allows them to use each of these types of voice acting in unique ways. Games oftentimes pull from more traditional mediums like film, literature, and music to create something entirely distinct, something unrepeatable in those other mediums. And this is no different in the way they implement voice. For example, while we do frequently see many games use voiced cutscenes in a traditional way to create movie-like scripted sequences, others utilize in-game cutscenes or hybrid forms of this technique to create transitions that don't fully pull the player out of their state of immersion. It's in these examples we see and hear our characters in the same way we're playing them, while the developer is still able to maintain full control over what occurs in the scene. Take this famous example from the opening scene in Half-Life, seen here in the fan remake Black Mesa. Every single thing that occurs here is meticulously designed, but because we're still in character, it creates a greater depth of immersion, and the voice we hear from the tram's announcement system is a major part of this. You must report to Black Mesa personnel for processing before you will be permitted into the high security branch of the transit system. 
In this moment, we continue to feel immersed in the situation, despite the fact that this is a completely scripted sequence, just like a regular cutscene. But this is an easy example of effective voice acting, right? It's a singular voice reading announcements through a PA system. And even though it does a great job of introducing the world we're about to enter, it's not incredibly complex voice work. How about elements of voice that are more difficult to portray, like conversational dialogue, the building of a relationship, and complex emotions like restrained frustration or deception? Well, let's turn to an example of in-game dialogue for that. Few games have ever done a better job at in-game voice acting than The Last of Us. While the game does contain traditional cutscenes, a large part of the dialogue you hear occurs as you're actively playing the game. We hear it in the casual back and forth between Joel and Ellie, the one-liners and banter, the questions and answers, or sometimes non-answers. Where do you usually meet him? Huh? Different places. So much of this dialogue is delivered so subtly and the voice actors are so skilled that it truly feels like a natural happenstance despite the fact that these are lines of dialogue that are injected by the developers at very intentional points on a very intentional story arc that occurs throughout the course of the game. And without the top-notch quality of voice acting present throughout The Last of Us, this relationship between Joel and Ellie would not be nearly as impactful. We know this because plenty of other games have tried this companion-based story before, and very few succeed at it through voice acting like the relationship between Booker and Elizabeth in Bioshock Infinite, which oftentimes feels stiff and a little too dramatic, or the father-son relationship in God of War that's built using similar in-game voice lines. The problem in this game is one of efficiency. In The Last of Us, even the one-off, seemingly throwaway lines feel like they contribute to the relationship. I dreamt about flying the other night. Oh yeah? Yeah. Go on, tell me about it. Whereas in God of War, the majority of Atreus' lines are empty dialogue consisting of him constantly pointing out things in the environment that are already obvious to the player. Hey look, a torch! Still can't get the doors open, huh? You're freezing at first! There's a white crystal ahead. You froze it in place. Nowhere to go from here, except across this bridge. Like, this is the literal quote from my notes I took while playing this game, and while it sounds a little harsh, I think it's sadly pretty spot on. Kratos, meanwhile, undoubtedly has a very cool sounding voice, but the closed off nature of his character is steered into so hard in the writing of his dialogue that the voice acting itself is almost inherently lacking any emotion other than anger and curmudgeoniness. I told you not to speak. These problems ultimately result in an inefficient use of dialogue, creating a situation in which actual compelling, significant interactions between Kratos and Atreus feel few and far between, despite the fact that they have a boatload of dialogue between them throughout the game. And this is disappointing, because there is some really strong voice acting in this game. It just oddly seems to always take place outside of the father and son relationship, which unfortunately is the main cog of the entire story. We do eventually get to experience some satisfying interactions here, but a lot of the voice work between those moments feels like a bit of a wasted opportunity. When barriers like this aren't dealt with properly, it can quickly change relationships that we should be invested in and care about into relationships about which we feel apathetic or even actively dislike. In fact, poor voice acting is one of the quickest ways to ensure that I will not care about a character. I have made literal life and death decisions in games, not due to how it might impact the story, but based on the fact that I was annoyed by a particular character due to poor voice acting. Yeah! Who won the lottery? I did! Now I think it's important to clarify that quality voice acting doesn't have to be serious or take place in a dramatic or complex story. The most important aspect of it is that it fits the tone of the game. So a game like Psychonauts that puts off heavy vibes of not taking itself too seriously is going to have much more cartoony voice acting, and it fits perfectly. What do you think's wrong with my brain, doctor? Well, how should I know? I'm a dentist! The wacky and offbeat voices coupled with the clever writing make the dialogue and conversations you hear one of the more enjoyable parts of the game. They're blended so well into the overall intended tone that the voice acting becomes a clear enhancement rather than a detractor. 
Fire Emblem Three Houses uses a style of voice heavily inspired by Japanese culture, which to Western ears can oftentimes sound childish or fake. And we'll burn this town to the ground! <laughs> but the voice acting in Three Houses strikes a balance that fits the tone of the game while not being off-putting, something that a lot of JRPGs struggle with. I mean, you're playing a game in which school children are asked to go fight life or death battles against trained soldiers and gruesome monsters as like a class assignment? Correct. We will not be participating. So this could have gone in a lot of directions. And while not every character in its large cast hits the mark, one of this game's voice acting achievements is that each voice fits exactly with the emotion or attribute it's intended to represent. Nearly all of the characters in this game embody one or two very clear characteristics, and both the writers and the voice actors are not shy in making sure the player knows exactly what those characteristics are. So the mysterious characters sound mysterious, the flirtatious ones sound flirtatious, and the charming ones sound like they're real monsters. It's not subtle, and at times it definitely still feels a little melodramatic but the characters remain pretty likable and it's one of the better implementations of this style of voice acting that I've experienced. On the other end of the spectrum, you have a game like Deus Ex Human Revolution, which tries its best to feel mature and heavy, something that's very apparent in its dialogue and character interactions. Damn, Adam, are you really gonna shake me down like this? That's cold. But the voice acting is just too inconsistent for it to ever hit that mark and it's certainly not helped by the really bizarre character designs and awkward facial expressions. Which are related factors that contribute to the player's experience with in-game voice lines that we'll get into in a minute. That consistency piece is really important as well. It's more understandable for a game like Portal 2 to nail all of its voice acting with the help of its focused linear story and its small cast of characters. But a massive sprawling RPG with dozens and dozens of voiced characters like Divinity Original Sin 2, it would be almost impossible to not expect some inconsistencies in the quality of voice acting in a game like that. And to be honest, with the sheer number of voiced characters you come across in this game, it's actually remarkably high quality for the most part. Was the freedom you promised merely another cruel joke of your kind? But after the main playable heroes, the narrator, and some standout side characters, we do see some of that inconsistency start to pop up. Surprisingly, this drop-off is actually most frequent in the game's enemies, who seem to be written and directed to fall pretty hard into the bad guy archetype, many times making their voice lines feel too theatrical to take seriously. You have no idea what you're really dealing with. We are ready, mistress. So we know that quality voice acting goes a long way in creating likable and memorable characters, developing an impactful narrative, and establishing a given mood or tone for the game. And, just as importantly, the opposite is true as well. Low quality voice acting can tank a player's attachment to a character and their place in the story. It's a big reason why characters like Nathan Drake are perceived as charming and funny, while characters like Adam Jensen are whatever this is. Reselling it? Providing a competitor? Now, because the voice itself is the most front-facing piece of voice acting, it's easy to blame the quality of the acting talent when these issues pop up. But this is certainly not always the case. Poor writing, inconsistent direction, discordant animations or art design, and time or budget constraints also play a role in this. And gaming history has provided us with a crystal clear example of how this can be the case. Remember the comparison between The Last of Us and Bioshock Infinite, with the former being a landmark moment in gaming storytelling and character development, and the latter being tonally inconsistent and lacking connection between characters? Remember how Joel's dialogue and relationship with Ellie was the highlight of that game, while Booker's dialogue oftentimes felt so video gamey. Well, that could be an issue of different talent voicing these characters, but we know that's not the case here. And we know that because this guy and this guy are both voiced by this guy. Troy Baker is one of the most decorated video game voice actors ever. In fact, I can almost guarantee you've played at least a few games in which he's voiced a character. 
And in 2013, Baker lent his voice to both Joel Miller from The Last of Us and Booker DeWitt from Bioshock Infinite. That means that in the same year, the same actor voiced the main protagonist in two games, both of which centered around the relationship between a protective male character and a younger female character, both of which used in-game dialogue throughout the course of the game to develop these relationships, and both of which depend heavily on that relationship's impact on the story. But in my opinion, there's a clear difference between what we got with Joel and what we got with Booker. Which is odd, because this is the same actor, at the same point in his career, delivering performances of two very similar characters. So, what's going on here? Well, an actor's job is to deliver the lines they're given the way the director or developer wants them to be delivered. And I think people can vastly underestimate the role that writing and direction can play on the finished product, even when working with top-notch voice talent. Baker's performance as Joel is impressive in part because the writing in The Last of Us feels so natural and organic. It feels like the way these two characters really would speak to each other as their relationship progresses. It uses the river's movement and uh, turns it into electricity. How does it do that? Look, I know what it is. I don't know how it does it. Booker and Elizabeth's dialogue, on the other hand, at times feels overdramatic and forced. And sometimes when the lines themselves are written dramatically, it can cause the actor to read those lines dramatically, to overact, so to speak. One thing I've learned, if you don't draw first, you don't get to draw at all. It's a case in which the writing of the dialogue played a huge role in the overall tone of the final game and the voice lines that were delivered to the player. But wait a minute, wasn't Ken Levine the lead writer for Bioshock Infinite? The same Ken Levine who was also the lead writer for the original Bioshock? The same Bioshock that delivered phenomenal performances by supporting characters Atlas and Andrew Ryan? The same Atlas and Andrew Ryan who were some of the best written and most memorable characters in gaming history? Correct. And that leads us to yet another complexity in the world of voice acting. Its purpose and the way it's delivered in the game. In Bioshock, Atlas and Ryan aren't having conversations with your character. They're providing direction and narration. You think that's a child down there? Don't be fooled. She's a little sister now. It's more or less a one-way street the writers of Bioshock used to tell the story. And writing this style of dialogue is vastly different from writing conversational dialogue, the majority of what we see between Booker and Elizabeth. Just like writing the conversations Geralt has in The Witcher 3 is a different skill than writing the environmental voice lines of NPCs in Hitman, which is a different skill than writing the responsive narration in Bastion. Air travel always was an iffy proposition. So even though Bioshock Infinite combined a super duo of one of the best voice actors of all time and one of the most well-respected creative minds in all of gaming, it still resulted in an underwhelming final product. It happens. There are so many elements that contribute to the actual lines of voice the player eventually hears while playing a game. And even one of these elements being out of whack can throw a wrench in some otherwise really quality work. Sometimes it's overdramatic acting. Sometimes it's poor character animations. Sometimes it's even a disconnect between the voice line and the tone that the game is presenting at the time. They're really gone, aren't they? Sean's out there, Codsworth. So while there may be some methods developers can follow to try to ensure that their voice acting enhances a game rather than detracts from it, it's not always a surefire recipe. I also want to be clear that voice acting is certainly not a necessary component, even to modern games. Many games excel not just with the absence of voice acting, but with the omission of it, even in situations when it may seem to make sense to have it. For example, throughout history, countless games have used constructed languages or fake languages that are essentially gibberish, but play the role of voicing communication between characters. And this isn't just a technique used by small studios who don't have the budget for full voice acting. In fact, perhaps the most famous example of this is the Simlish language used in the Sims series. A very intentional decision by game director Will Wright to not use real language in the game. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. And think about it. 
Would The Sims be nearly as quirky and charming as it is if the game's characters spoke actual lines of dialogue from the player's spoken language? Most retro-inspired games choose to not include voiced characters, not necessarily because they can't afford to do it, but because it would feel out of place in a world that is meant to remind us of a previous generation when this option really didn't exist much. Many Nintendo games have effectively not been using voice acting for a long time now. Even as voiced characters were introduced to the Legend of Zelda series, for example, they've been mainly limited to expressions, gasps, and other anime bullshit. What? Sorry, they've been mainly limited to voiced emotions rather than actual voiced phrases. Expressive linguistic sound effects that are universally understood no matter what language the player speaks. Sa -sa! And this method kind of feels good. It fits. While many counterparts to the Zelda games have fully embraced voiced characters, there's something comforting and dependable about the way Nintendo does this. And when they did finally introduce full voice acting into the games... I'm not sure how to put this into words. I'm actually quite embarrassed to say it. Oh boy. These voiced sound effects aren't the only way to add voice to a game without the need for fully voiced conversations between characters. More and more frequently, games are using NPC voice lines to add depth to their environments. You hear this a lot as you walk down a crowded street and hear lines or even full conversations between characters you walk by. Does anyone speak English? The Hitman series does an excellent job of introducing this technique into its sound design. Just take a listen to this footage. What we hear in this scene is an absolute bustle of sounds and conversations, helping to bring the crowded street to life just as much as the congested visuals do. You can hear many conversations all going on at once, even though you can't fully comprehend them. Just like in real life, Individual dialogue can get drowned out by a large number of conversations occurring simultaneously. And in fact, one of the key mechanics in these games is being able to overhear specific conversations that provide intel and unlock opportunities the player can use to complete the mission. Get down here this instant, Rocco. You'd be like your first day at work. Voice acting is essential here. And while it can be inconsistent, Mothers lock up your daughters, eh? <laughs> Great stuff. The most important part for this particular game is that the information is being clearly conveyed to the player if they know where to look, and more importantly, where to listen. In Hitman, voice is not just a bonus feature, it's a crucial part of the gameplay. Further still, many modern games get by without voicing their characters in any way. Outer Wilds has a cast of alien characters you communicate with through traditional text. No voice at all. And while I'm sure the developers could have introduced voice acting in a charming way that fit the oddball nature of the characters, I think I just prefer it the way it is. Outer Wilds lives and breathes on the concept of an isolated, mysterious adventure into the unknown. One of the game's greatest accomplishments is its ability to draw out feelings of lonesomeness, longing, and discovery. And its use of negative audio space or the absence of sound plays a crucial role in being able to pull this off. Just as fully voiced characters in some games can help immerse the player into the world, voice acting in Outer Wilds likely would have pulled the player out of the world, leaving an out of place impression on an otherwise supernatural experience. Still, there are plenty of games out there that gain so much from using some form of voice. Games with reactive narration like The Stanley Parable would be nearly impossible and certainly not as charming without it. Stanley was so bad at following directions, it's incredible he wasn't five years ago. The characters in Hades are given such distinctive personalities through their voice work, making finding your next boon from the gods or having a new conversation with an NPC on your next run that much more enjoyable each time. The Uncharted series, well known for being action movie in a video game, now turned into actual action movie, is able to push a film-inspired narrative the way it wants to in large part due to its voice acting. When done well, voice acting can accomplish a lot for a game as a powerful tool for immersing the player into the intended experience. It can help the player form bonds and connections to a game's characters. 
It has a great track record for adding depth to the soundscape of gaming environments. And with good writing, it's unsurprisingly one of the best ways to inject humor into a game. I just need a tooth from that dragon. This is why it's so important that when a developer does decide to implement voice as part of their game, they give the necessary effort and allocate the necessary resources needed to use this tool to enhance the experience rather than take away from it. Because for every example of quality voice work being used in a game, there's always an Alvin waiting around the corner. Caroline is dead. The dogs ate her. Do you ever clean out a jailhouse bathroom with nothing but a pair of underwear and three bottles of diet lemonade? Yes. Maybe. 